This picture was when we were arriving at, uh, I think it was the Deauville Hotel yeah. in Miami. I think your quote in the book was, I can almost hear her scream. Yeah, you can't. <laughs> the cop's got to restrain her, you know. I also love the cop in the foreground who just sort of looks yeah. puzzled by everything. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I like the architecture so of do I. that Actually hotel. Level. But, you know, as we were saying before, that was had to be taken really quickly. Yeah. She had to snap that. Yeah. But you have to have an eye to take that. It's my left one. <laughs> but you have to have an eye to take that. It's my left one. <laughs> but you have to have an eye to take that. It's my left one. <laughs> But you have to have an eye to take that. It's my left one. <laughs> welcome, 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 everybody, to a very special edition of Glass Onions. Uh, one that I am sure will go over at least two weeks. Um, because, man, I got to tell you something. When I have this guest on... Uh, it's like Christmas morn. I mean, it really, really is. And I got to be honest, man, I don't bother him as much as I should because I know he's very, very busy. He's got two uh, tremendously popular sites, Sage of Quay, the Paul is Dead channel. Not only that, bro, he's a great musician. I've heard his stuff. Mike sends me his stuff all the time, and I absolutely love it. Hey, listen. As far as I'm concerned, this man is a national treasure. I'm just going to say it, and I'm just going to put it out there. And it's an honor to always have him on the show. And I am talking about the great Mike Williams. Mike, <laughs> there's, no way, there's no way I can live up to that, bitch. Come on, Mike. Come on. You, you know I love having you on this show. <laughs> well, Mike, thank I, you for having me back. I got to tell you, and you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, bro. Um, attention span gets shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. And Mike, this has really kind of dictated the way that I watch television because 99% of the time I'm on YouTube. And the first thing I look at is length. And, you know, <laughs> bro, 30 minutes is real close. Like anything over 30 minutes, I'm not watching. It's too long. Right. But then I come up to Sage of Quay, and it's two, two and a half, three hours. And, Mike, I sit there and I watch the whole thing. Your show is the only show that keeps me there for three hours. Well, thank you, Vince. I'm glad that I'm keeping your interest. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, Mike, listen, I find it so fascinating because I believe uh, the last time – I had you on the show, which was a while ago. Mike, you were you were close to packing it up. You you were done. You were walking away into the sunset. Mike, what happened, Mike? What happened? What happens, Vince, is that the rabbit hole gets deeper and deeper. So just when you think, okay, I've gotten to a point where I can step away from this and move on to other stuff, something else pops up. And so, you know, it piques your interest and you think to yourself, okay, let me take a look. And before you know it, a whole like other story now is, is unrolling, you know? And uh, it's like, I know we're not going to probably talk about this, but as an example, I had another researcher on my channel, Stacy, who went into uh, possibilities with regard to Billy, who plays the role of Paul McCartney, his, his family and his ancestry. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I wasn't really planning on getting into that, but then somebody contacts me and she did very compelling work. It was very, very good work. And uh, so that's an example of how that really wasn't on the radar per se, but then it lands in your lap. So you have to make a decision. Do I do something with this or do I just turn my back and, and walk away? So I decided, well, after seven years or so of doing this, I might as well do it, right? Well, and, and Mike, the thing with you is, like, this is what is so unbelievable about you. You you don't just come on here and do a podcast, uh, Mike. You got to do a slide presentation that takes you about five and a half years, which is so thorough. And you've got everything. Mike, nobody, nobody makes a presentation like you. 
Well, thank you, Vincent. But the reason why I do that is because I'm doing research in an area that most people just don't want to listen to. Right. They don't believe it. Right. So if you're just going to come on and talk about it, well, then it's just words. But if you can help the presentation by putting up the slides and explaining what's going on and connecting some dots, hopefully you can get some people to better understand what it is that you're bringing forth. So that's why the slide presentations are important. Oh, extremely important. I got to tell you though, Mike, I tried so hard to follow this and I, I, I think I got lost in this one. I got lost in the 28 if. I, I, I was trying so hard to follow that. Man, I stopped it. I went back. I stopped. That was a hard one for me to follow. It was quite a decoding. And the guy that did it was uh, John Black. And he's a subscriber of my channel. And he just sent me an email and said, I think I've decoded the license plate on the Abbey Road album. And, um, you know, over the years, I've heard I've heard different iterations and uh, theories about what the plate means. So when John brought it to me, I said, okay, let me take a look. So he shared it with me. Um, but basically, uh, to, you know, just to summarize it, what John did was to show that the plate was really an anagram. It created an anagram. Mm -hmm. And from that anagram, there were some missing letters mm -hmm. and the two and the eight like LMW is the plate. It's LMW 28 IF. And mm -hmm. actually, the, my British subscribers have said to me that the letter I doesn't exist in your license plates. It's the number one, because otherwise ones and I's can, can get, you know, right, mixed up right. and confused. But in either case, uh, it, it really, for the sake of what the Beatles were doing on the album, it really doesn't matter whether it's a one or an I. In my opinion, um, Billy was using it as an I. LMW 28 if. And so what John did was to decode the LMW part, which is um, Lady Madonna uh, Wednesday. So Lady Madonna Wednesday. And so mm -hmm. what comes after Wednesday in the song? Well, well Wednesday mornings, papers didn't come. Mm -hmm. So papers didn't come is the how the anagram was created. And when he did the anagram and worked on it, papers didn't come, spelt out P. McCartney uh, dies, OPD, officially pronounced dead. So for those who followed Paul is dead, uh, conspiracy, OPD is the patch that mm -hmm. Billy or Paul McCartney is wearing in the gatefold of the Sgt. Pepper album, officially mm -hmm. pronounced dead. But the anagram was missing two letters. It was missing a C and it was missing a Y. So the 28 part was telling us that after the second letter in the anagram, PM McCartney, you have to insert a letter. Well, that other that letter was the letter C because McCartney has two C's, M, C, C, mm -hmm. A, A, R, T, N, E, Y. And then after the eighth letter, in this case, in the anagram, and what I'll do is I'll put the link in the in the show for you. Yeah, so that'd be everybody, great. That would so be everybody great. can see it because they're yes. probably going, I don't know what this guy's talking about. But if you insert the the Y after the eighth letter, which was E, then you get the full spelling of P. McCartney and then dies OPD. So the if part, what John was saying was, if you replace the letters, if you put the proper letters in its place after the second and eighth position of the anagram, mm -hmm. the missing letters, then you get the word P. McCartney or Paul McCartney and then dies OPD. So what John is saying is that the license plate is telling us that Paul McCartney was dead. Paul McCartney wasn't there in 1969, in September of 69, when Abbey Road was released. Another clue of that Volkswagen on the cover of Abbey Road, it's a Volkswagen Beetle. And right, it's a Volkswagen yeah. Beetle. So yeah. I believe another uh, clue that was being dropped because these clues that the Beatles were dropping on the album covers, um, many times it, it had more than one meaning. Mm -hmm. So John's decoding could very well be. Then Stacy came on and 
She had another, that's the researcher who did his family tree, his ancestry. She had another interpretation, which was also very compelling, that goes back to his uh, his ancestry. And I won't get into that because that's a, that's a long drawn out uh, you know, explanation that I'll probably screw up. <laughs> I'll, leave, I'll leave the link to that one too down below. And, um, but my interpretation after so many years is I think what they were telling us is that there were five beetles on Abbey Road. There were four that were going across the crosswalk, which included Billy as Paul McCartney. And then there was the Volkswagen Beetle on the left-hand side of the road or our left, mm -hmm. which would be an indication of the Beatles and their involvement in um, uh, paganism, Thelema, Crowley's Thelema, the left-handed path. Okay, so if that gets a bit esoteric for some folks, we'll just leave it at the Volkswagen Beetle represented the fifth Beetle who was not there because, you know, he had passed away back in 1966. So anyway, uh, we'll leave a link, folks, down below yes. for that. It's a very short video. It's about, I think, it's less than 10 minutes. And uh, if yeah, you have yeah. any questions, just leave a comment and I'll explain. You are always blowing my mind. Now, before we get into, I, I've got numerous topics. I, I, I do want to ask you this though: Who? And, and let's 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 give the credit where it came from. The woman's name escapes me. That came up with the with the the uh, fake guy, what, Sally what Whitty. Sally Whitty. I got it. So so my just just tell people briefly uh, what what Sally has uncovered. Sally uncovered that. Billy, Billy Shears, the person who's playing the role of Paul McCartney and has been, he has the primary contract since 1966. He has a artificial eye, his right eye, he's blind in his right eye. And obviously he can see with his left. And going back, I would say probably about uh, a year ago or so, we have a little group, a little forum um, that we converse on and we share information with each other. It's it's myself and three or four other very close colleagues and friends, and we've been together for, for years. And so she was putting some images up of, of Billy's eye, of Paul McCartney's eye. What is she getting at here? I, you know, and, and so finally it dawned on me, well, I, I think she's saying that he has a problem with his right eye. And uh, so what happened was Sally and I spoke, and uh, originally that, that revelation that Billy is blind in his right eye was going to be part of a larger presentation because she was going to get into a lot of esoteric mythology with regard to Pan and stuff like that, because the Beatles are all, you know, intertwined with uh, a lot of mythology, Egyptian mythology, Greek mythology, Roman mythology. And I said to her, you know what, don't do that. This is too important because him having an artificial eye is proof positive that he is not biological Paul, right? We could talk about he's taller than Paul. He has uh, different ears. His jawline is longer, all of that stuff. All of that stuff is true, but it's not as concrete as knowing that he has a fake eye, an ocular prosthetic. And uh, I should also say that the, the way that Sally caught this is because Sally has an artificial eye. Mm -hmm. She's blind in her left eye. And so what she did was she was just watching videos of him and she was taking a look at images, stills. And she picked up on the fact that his, his right eye, which he's blind in, was not always tracking with mm -hmm. his left eye. Now, the tracking is actually very good because Billy obviously has the best doctors working with him. And there's a misconception out there, I should explain this to the audience, that some people think that if you have an artificial eye that it doesn't move, it's static, it just looks straight ahead. It's not true. Uh, depending upon the level of damage to the eye, I mean, if you have a lot of damage to the eye, that could be that the eye is static. But in mm -hmm. most cases, that's not the case. Um, your ocularist will, will ensure that you have movement with the eye that's artificial. And what Sally found was uh, it's more observable when you see Billy in concert. 
So when he's looking right, he's looking left. What I've noticed is whenever he looks hard left, his right eye, his eye that he's blind in, doesn't move as far left as his good eye. Mm -hmm. So that's where you see the, the alignment issue with his eyes. So then what happened was, so we presented this back in October of 2022, and it was it was quite a revelation. And uh, Mike, let me ask you one question before you go f uh, forward. Yeah. Uh, be before um, I forget this, now you you mentioned that this is um, very very important because again, you know the the real Paul McCartney did not have a artificial eye, right? But however, my question to you is: once Billy took over. How do we know he didn't lose his eye at that point? You, 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 you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. That question has come up before. So um, Sally and I discussed this in the uh, follow-up show that we did. I, I guess it was about two months ago or so. I lose track of time sometimes. It becomes a big blur. But uh, anything's possible. Let's just say that, right? It right, could have happened, right, right, right. But Sally said it's highly unlikely because she said that um, people who lose an eye early on in life, they are much more adaptable to um, being comfortable with the eye. Mm -hmm. So because because you, you lost your eye at a young age, you have a lot of time, a lot of runway to get yourself acclimated to seeing only with one eye. She said that it's it's difficult for adults when they lose an eye. Mm -hmm to have that sense of orientation. In other words, you know, um, things just might seem off um, perspective wise and, and stuff like that. So her, uh, she leans toward at a young age, he lost his eye. But like I said, anything is possible. But, but she right. said the fact that he's so natural with it would lend credence to the argument that he lost it much earlier in life as a kid. Right, right. Yeah. Now, now, Mike, here's the only thing I would ask. And th this is, listen, man, when you look at the footage, bro, you know, if Mike, Mike, if you could le leave the link for this as well. I will. If you guys look at the footage, there's, there's no question there is an issue with that eye. There right. is absolutely no question about it whatsoever. The, the, I'm just going to throw this out at you, Mike, because this is just going to be your opinion. If this is true, then why wouldn't he have made it public? I mean, Sammy Davis Jr., you know, perfect example. And in, in the prime of his uh, uh, his stardom, you know, he got in that car accident and he lost an eye. And we knew Sammy had, you know, why, why wouldn't Billy, why wouldn't this be made public, do you think? It wouldn't be made public because Paul McCartney never made any mention to real Paul McCartney, biological Paul McCartney, about having any issues with his eyes. He had two good eyes. So for Billy, as Paul McCartney, to come out at some point and to talk about it, then what's going to happen is there's going to be a discussion about how did it happen. And, um, and how did you avoid... Uh, the the public arena. Mm -hmm. If you had a problem with your eye, you had an accident and you were blind. You know your right eye became blind. Well, he's such a public figure, and he's everywhere. Then the question would be: So when was the the downtime when the eye was healing, or when you were right. getting acclimated to having a, an ocular prosthetic? So um, I, I think Vince, again, my opinion is the reason why it didn't come out was because biological Paul had two good eyes and for, for it to come up would have created a whole set of issues. Yeah, that, it, it, yeah, it opens up a Pandora's box. It didn't have to be discussed because- yeah, I got, most, yeah, that makes sense. Most people don't see the eye, don't see the yeah. bad eye. So, yeah, you know, it's just makes business sense. as usual. Now, now I, here's one of the topics today. I got to reach down. Um, Mike, nobody has studied memoirs like you. Nobody. Absolutely nobody. And Mike, as a guy that hates to read, that is the last book I read. Uh, and I went through that book and I tried to understand it as best as I could. Now, 
I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about this. And of course, this I, I wish this was an original mic, but it's not. There you go. Mike's, it, it, Mike, is that an original? Well, actually, I have originals. Um, this one is a replica of what they call the first state. This would have been the uh, one of the promo copies that went out. Right. But I have actuals. I'll, I'll show them as we talk. Oh, my gosh. Okay, now, here's the first question I, I want to ask you. Mike, I don't remember this at all being discussed in memoirs, was it? No, I, it, it wasn't discussed in memoirs. Is that a little odd to you? Now that you mention it, it probably is a little odd. Um, and probably because it would get into a discussion about why it was done. Um, I guess it could have been inserted into the uh, into the chapters that talk about the um, the occultism around the Beatles. It could have been inserted there. In fact, you know what? I'm going to drop uh, Tom U. Harriet an email and ask him. <laughs> See, I made that happen, right? Yeah, yes, Mike. All right, let's get. Yeah, because I, but I mean, Mike, everything was covered in that book, and yeah. I just found it really odd. I, because I, as I, I was thinking, I, I don't think it was spoken about. No. So, Mike, to give a little background, just to let everybody know, this this uh, uh, this album came out March 25th, 1966. There was a photographer by the name of Robert Whitaker, and there was a photo session um, for this album cover in which the the Beatles and Mr. Whitaker they they uh, whether they were having fun. Uh, we'll we'll get to that we'll get to that in a minute. But a lot of strange photos were taken because it wasn't just the 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 doll parts and the meat. No, right? There were bird cages involved, and even I know now what that means. Okay, <laughs> and, and you can explain that to everybody. But my, you know, Mike, see this I did not know as as I as I got into other um, shots for the record cover. There's. George Harrison driving a nail in John Lennon's head. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you guys have to understand this. This is 60, 65. And, you know, we're still talking about the cute and cuddly Beatles. Like this is such to the other extreme that they're doing a photo session like this. And even thinking about, putting out an album cover like this. Um, and you you sent me a clip, and I had read that um, as well, that they weren't going to go with the Butcher cover, but but John Lennon was really a fan of that, and John Lennon kind of pushed the issue, and, and uh, Brian Epstein went along with it, sold it to the record company, and they printed the album cover. Yeah. Mike, I really, I, I so want your thoughts on this, the the purpose behind the photo shoot, how in God's name the cover made it to press. Did somebody actually think this was a good idea and this was a goof? Or again, we've learned this about Illuminati, man. They put it out there. They put it out there right in front of your face so we can't say you didn't tell us. They they put it out there, but it's so unbelievable that nobody believes it. Right. I mean, that's that that's the gimmick. So just just kind of give me a little background and and your thoughts and theories into this album cover. Okay, so like you said Robert Whitaker was the uh the photographer doing the photo shoots and the clip I sent you of um, of John Lennon discussing the uh, the Butcher cover, he explains that uh, Robert Whitaker was a surrealist, and you know, and the Beatles themselves were in favor of doing the the photo shoot and uh, what became the the Butcher album cover because um, it was different. They got tired of the plain old you know straightforward photo shoots and um, and album covers. And uh, in that interview, John states that uh, he really wanted to do it. So the reason why I'm explaining that is because uh, there are folks that are in the you know Polish Dead research and in the Polish Dead community that believe that the Beatles were forced to do that album cover. And they really didn't want to do it. Of course, that's a natural reaction because you, you, you're thinking to yourself, "Well, I don't, you know, I, I idolize these guys and." 
I, I don't really want to get behind the fact that this was something they wanted to do because mm -hmm. it's, 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 uh, it's a strange album cover to say the mm -hmm. least. So in any case, you know, John says that uh, they wanted to do it. And John uh, specifically said, you know, he was leading the charge on it. And I'll leave the, the link to that interview as well. Folks can listen to it. So I believe what happened, and I'll give you my opinion on this, Vince, is that the Beatles as an entity are just immersed in the occult. There's a lot of occultism around the Beatles. And if you go to my channel, uh, this is to the audience. I have a number of presentations where I take everybody through this. And what they do every once in a while is to float something out there as a trial balloon, as part of the conditioning process. So you didn't see the Beatles, you know, this way ever before. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, there was a cultism on their other album covers and I can show you some of that in a bit, but it wasn't this blatant. So what happened was Capitol sent promotional copies out. And in the interview that John Lennon did uh, that we just talked about, I think he said about 60,000 copies went out. Mm -hmm. And when they went out, and, and this is in the US, by the way, because yesterday and today, which is what, which was the title of the album was a U.S. capital release. It was not a U.K. release. Um, so it went out as, as a promotional copy. And then, of course, the, the backlash, people who received it, DJs and so on, were like, what is this? And well, so... To, to stop you there, Mike, and I hate to interrupt you, but I, I, I want to hit key points. They had to know that was going to be the, the, the feedback. Yeah, they did okay. know. They did know. And that's, you know, that's it. That's, that's the, the thing. They did know. They knew what the reaction was going to be, but it was shock value. And they knew that, you know, once you have that in, that in your head, right, once, once the news went out that this album cover was the initial cover for the, for the Beatles uh, Capitol release yesterday and today, that it was going to draw people's attention to it. See, that's what it's all about with occultism. Occultism is about drawing your attention, your focus, and your consciousness to focus your thoughts on what they want you to focus on. So even though this was, this was on the surface, short-lived, it really wasn't short-lived. Because what happened afterwards is, in fact, well, let me just read this here for you. Um, there's a letter that went out. Yeah, from I, I, I Go ahead, read it. I, I have yeah. it right up here, but go ahead and read it. I think it's important. Yeah. Okay. So it says, uh, dear reviewer. So it went out to reviewers and I think it went out to DJs. So if this wasn't the, the original album, my understanding is it did not go out to retail. Okay. So it says, dear reviewer, in the past few days, you may have received an advanced promotional copy of the Beatles' new album, the, yes, the Beatles' Yesterday and Today. In accordance with the following statement from Alan Livingston, president of Capitol Records, the original album cover is being discarded and a new jacket is being prepared. So it goes on to say the original cover created in England was intended as, quote, pop art. And we'll get into this as we talk more about uh, Taylor Swift. However, a sampling of public opinion in the United States, a sampling of public opinions, in other words, they're polling to see how receptive the album was to the public in the United States indicates that the cover design is subject to misinterpretation for this reason and to avoid any possible controversy or undeserved harm to the Beatles image or reputation. <laughs> Capital has chosen to withdraw the LP and substitute a more generally accepted design. All consumer copies of the Beatles album will be packaged in the new cover, which will be available within the next week to 10 days. As soon as they are, we will forward you a copy. In the meantime, we would appreciate your discarding the promotional album and if at all possible, mm -hmm. returning it COD to Capitol Records, 1750 North Vine Street, Hollywood, California, 90028. Thank you in advance for your cooperation. Sincerely, Ron Tepper, Manager of Press and Information Services for Capitol Records. Can you imagine, Mike, if you were one of those people that sent it back? Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, that's the thing, right? So, uh, so when we talk about, it, so you're making a good point because you're segueing into what I was going, where I was going to go next, Vince. Yeah. So even though it was kind of, it appeared to be a temporary thing, sixty thousand copies or whatever, it has lived on. So yeah. then, what happened was, then, Capital released yesterday and today with this cover. Right. Now, supposedly, this was shot at the same session. Was it? From 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 what I read, it was. But I I think Lenin says something different because the article I read this was this was shot as well. So I'm saying, if they shot this. They had to know that this was a backup. Right. I mean, no question. You do not have the extremes of the birdcage and the body parts and the and the nail in the head and then this. But that clip you sent me from John Lennon, he he uh he alludes to the fact that they went back and reshot a yeah. thing and and this was it. Yeah. So I don't know whether it was shot the same day or afterward, but in either case, what happened was this wound up being the new cover and you can see uh, look at the difference folks between the covers let me just go back to um uh, here it is okay so we have this image here right the original cover and they're all smiling and happy <laughs> and then we get to the the replacement cover not and they're happy. all demure yeah, right <laughs> okay now the reason why the butcher has cover has lived on in infamy is because if we take a look here Right, I don't know if you can see this, but that's that's Ringo's right, turtleneck. Right. Yeah. Okay. The black. So now bait. what happened was they slicked over the original cover. So now what people were doing was they were either leaving these alone, knowing they had a butcher, or they were steaming the covers off. And so by steaming the covers off, now people are re-engaging with that album cover. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That people. Yeah, you know, that people you know weren't supposed to see. So for those who steamed it off, now this is a steamed copy. Okay. Wow, that's a steamed copy. That's a steamed copy. It's wow, really that's good. the best I, steamed I've, copy I've ever seen. I've had these for years. All right. So wow. the, the point being is that the butcher cover never went away. It was still in the consciousness of Beatle fans, and so the focus has always been there. And in fact. And I checked on eBay this morning because I, I haven't, you know, I haven't looked at records in a long, long time. You, you know that I have a large collection like you do. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I have, I have had for a very long time now. Mm -hmm. um, but I went on to eBay to take a look at what the butchers are getting. Now, depending upon whether it's first state, first state is the original promotional copy. Second state is the, is the paste over with the mm -hmm. trunk cover, which, by the way, is a Paul is dead clue. Bill, uh, Paul sitting in a trunk. Right. right? And, uh, and then we have the third state, which is the peeled uh, covers, and they're going they're going for like anywhere between twelve hundred and five thousand dollars. Crazy man yeah. on eBay. So this this still highly collectible, and uh, so you know it's like I said, it's one of those things where it was uh, it was table setting, it was conditioning, it was to get people to take a look at the Beatles in a different light. Like, what's this all about? So that whole clean cut image, that is that has been kind of demolished, right? With with the butcher cover. Because they're doing something here that's very, very strange and for many people very disturbing. And it is, it's a very disturbing album cover. So it's it's about implanting and, and putting into people's heads, you know, um a different thoughts. So that this way, what, what they do down the road, when I say they, I'm talking about the controller. So I, I will probably talk a little bit about Tavistock and CIA and stuff like that. It's about changing your opinions um, and, and moving people in a different direction. So that, to me, is what the Butcher cover was all about. And um, like I said, it wasn't short-lived. To this day, people are still yeah, talking about absolutely, it. Absolutely, man. Now, Mike, you blew me away with a little, little, uh, you dropped a little line in one of your emails to me as far as the song selection. Yeah. I've now this I've never ever heard before, man. So this I, I can't wait to hear from you. Yeah. So what happened was um, I've always found the song sequencing on the album to be uh, a little odd in the sense that it appeared to me like they were telling a story. So if we go back to 
the paste over cover here. Mm -hmm. We could see Paul is sitting in a trunk. Mm -hmm. So this is a clue. Paul is dead. So think of the trunk as like a coffin. Okay. And, and as we just mentioned, everybody has this kind of demure, demure, unhappy look on their face. right? And it's the Beatles yesterday, in the past, and today, today and moving forward. So if we take a look at the songs, right, let's just read them off. So at this point, I have uh, contended that Billy, the person playing Paul McCartney, he just did not appear in September of 1966 to take on the role of Paul McCartney. I believe that Billy has been in the inner circle of the Beatles, uh, possibly as a ghost writer, um, possibly as a session musician on their recorded tracks, going back to 1962. Well, so, yeah, because well, yeah, see, that's the thing that I was a little confused of, Mike, because this photo session they are saying was um, March, March of 1966. Yeah. So if, if the replacement would have come in September of 66. Yeah. Then this, this. When you're, if you're just going by the dates, this album should have nothing to do with Billy, right? What, right. what do you? What's your thoughts on that? No, uh, I, I, Billy, I believe Billy's been there for since '62. I believe as early as 1962. I, I believe based upon the research. Well, let me just give you an example of a good example of why I believe Billy was there be, before 1966. A number of years ago, going back about four or five years ago, I think it was, and it's in my big presentation, going back to April of 2020, did the Beatles write all their own music? Mm -hmm. Billy, he was quoted as saying that he wrote the music to In My Life, the Beatles song In My Life, mm -hmm. which has always been credited to John Lennon. It was a John Lennon song. Mm -hmm. Now, In My Life was released in 1965. So the question becomes, Okay, so most people look at it this way. Paul McCartney is saying he wrote the music to In My Life and, and John was more, um, his thing was the lyrics to the song. So what happened was when Billy came out and said he wrote the music to In My Life, the press, the mainstream press went into damage control. So what happened was there was two universities, I forgot who they were, um, that were given the task to run a computer model to determine who was the actual songwriter for In My Life. And the computer model came back and said, nope, Paul McCartney or Billy misremembered. Mm. John Lennon wrote that song, right? Now, here's the thing. Folks, as a songwriter myself, mm -hmm. um, you never forget a song that you wrote, especially when it is a classic. And In My, in my Life mm. is a Beatles song that... Whenever it is a, a classic rock poll by Rolling Stone magazine or Billboard magazine, it always, always ends up in the upper tier of mm -hmm. the ranking, the top 100 or whatever, top 50. It's always in the top 10. Mm -hmm. So you just don't forget writing a song. Oh, like that. God, so, no. so he didn't misremember. So what yeah. he was doing was he was dropping a clue. He was saying that, hey, I was there back in 1965. Wow. And I wrote the music to in my life. It's no different than uh, George Martin saying that he wrote the guitar lead for Michelle. Mm -hmm. There's an interview of him saying that that's his composition. A lot of people believe that Paul McCartney wrote that entire song and, you know, George Harrison maybe wrote the, the guitar lines or the, the leads to the songs. And, you know, and George Martin in an interview going back many years ago, turns around and says, nope, that was me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the point I'm trying to make is all of this stuff about the Beatles writing all their own stuff and all that. I mean, you know, it's dropping clues to let you know that the official narrative has some holes and some gaps in it. So in any case, going back to Billy and in my life, there you go. He's telling us, hey, you know, back in 1965 when the song was released, you know, really what he was saying is the musical, the instrumental aspects of the song, that was his composition. He wrote it. So I believe, yeah, he goes back to 62. So when we take a look at the uh, the Beatles Yesterday and Today album, 
what what that album is telling us, in my opinion, is that it's setting the stage. It's it's kind of a, a, a you know a prequel to what's going to happen. Now, did Paul McCartney know that that his runway was really short at this point in time? No, I don't. I don't think he knew. But the album cover itself, I, I think, is telling us. So if we take a look at the songs, yesterday. Uh, the whole song yesterday is like his eulogy. Um, then it goes to Dr. Robert. So now we're getting into Dr. Robert. We're getting into drugs, the mm -hmm. drug culture. And, um, so that's being introduced. And when we think about it, Billy was responsible for the Beatles making the switch from the boy band from the 1962 to 66 period to the psychedelic period. Right. Right. So it's kind of table setting for Billy and the psychedelic era of Sgt. Pepper and Magical Mystery Tour. Mm -hmm. I'm only sleeping. <laughs> okay. If, if you're not here anymore and you have passed away, you are sleeping. Mm -hmm. And your bird can sing. You know, the lyrics to And Your Bird Can Sing are very interesting. It, it talks about, so you think you have everything. And so it, it, the way I interpreted the song with regard to the Paul is Dead conspiracy is that Billy's stepping in and it's almost like, hey, be careful what you wish for, because this is going to be a rough road, mm -hmm. right? Also, the the Beatles, this was mentioned in another interview I did um, with uh, Charles Moskowitz going back about three or four weeks ago. Um, the Beatles have a number of songs with the word bird in it. Mm -hmm. And so when you take a look at Alistair Crowley and you look at the OTO, that's his... his uh, his esoteric secret society that he, he ran um, the it's called a layman and the layman has symbols on it. And, and it has at the top, it's the all seeing eye, the Egyptian all seeing eye, the eye of Horus, the eye of Ra. Then it's got a dove. And then below it, there's like a chalice and it's uh, the, the rose and the cross, which I'm thinking goes back to the Rosicrucians. But, what I was most focused on was the, the dove, the bird in the middle. And so I thought to myself, well, and your bird can sing could have two meanings. One is that, hey, be careful what you ask for. And the second thing could be that his his ties back to Crowley, mm -hmm. back to uh, Crowley's religion of Thelema and his, his uh, society of um, the OTO. Okay, so I know that's a bit of a long-winded explanation, but... That's why I think it's possible that And Your Bird Can Sing was placed on the album. Oh, by the way, we're told in the official narrative that the guitar leads in that song, which is a double guitar lead, mm -hmm. that that was just whipped up in the studio and played by George Harrison and Paul McCartney. Okay, so that, that's another very far-fetched story because yeah. that, is not, that is not an easy guitar riff to play. And it's mm -hmm. being played in unison, whether they're playing together or even if it's being double tracked, done by one person tracked and a second person comes in, tracks over it, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, trust me, I that wasn't Paul McCartney and George Harrison whipping that up in the studio on the spot. Yeah. That just didn't happen. We can work it out. Life is very short. Mm -hmm. So here is another is a, another song which is telling us that there's, you know, there's challenges and difficulties. Day Tripper, one-way ticket, yeah. Okay, one-way ticket. So one-way ticket, Paul out, one-way ticket, Billy in. Nowhere Man. So, you know, talking about the Nowhere Man. Um, Billy comes into the, into the picture and uh, he's got to figure out a way to assimilate into this band really coming from, if you look at it, coming from nowhere, because nobody knows publicly who he was. Right, right. Is, right. So that what goes on, I mean, it's really self-explanatory. What goes on is what's going on here. Drive my car. Well, Paul was, you know, the, the uh, conspiracy, the prevailing conspiracy says that he was killed in a car crash. If I needed someone, Billy needs the Beatles. So we have this symbiotic relationship now that has to come together in order for the band to continue. 
and then all he needs to do is act naturally. Act naturally. Okay. I, I just, you know, yeah. whenever I look at the sequencing of the songs, Vince, I just thought it's, it's telling a story. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So again, folks, I'm just giving you my interpretation. Others will have a different opinion, but um, you know, this album is a very important album in my view uh, as it pertains to the, uh, the Paul is dead conspiracy. <sighs> wow. All right, Mike, Mike, where do you, where do you want to go? Well, what I was going to do, Vince, was uh, I was going to go through some of the other early albums to show you some of the, the occultism around. Just, please. just go through it real quick. Please, okay? no, please do. Please do. Okay, so the other thing I want to mention about the, the Butcher cover, because some folks may be asking, well, what does it mean? So I had a comment uh, come in. I have a lot of very astute subscribers. Uh, a lot do. of folks are very knowledgeable in the occult. And... Uh, one person wrote that the Masonic connection and ritual connected to the impending death of Paul are transparent. Obviously, the butcher cover shows a severed baby's head in Paul's lap. So Paul was, the conspiracy says that Paul was decapitated in a car crash. Yeah. So there, there's the, there's the severed baby's head. Yeah. Okay. He's also showing a wristwatch. And the wristwatch, Paul's holding it, Vince has it there, over the baby's head. So this is a reference to time and death. Also, Kronos, Saturn, or Satan. All right, so this goes back to Luciferianism. And then this, this person goes on to well, say... And, and, you know, it's it's interesting because let, let, let's, let's be honest, Mike, when we look at that, first of all, this is the only... This is the only watch visible and this right. is this is dead center right I, I mean this is dead center pull up the sleeve and show the watch right and the baby's head sitting in his lap it's exactly. right exactly exactly yeah yeah it's very strange so he this person goes on to say that paul was probably uh, unaware of all this but no wonder he was having bad dreams nightmares so then i had a note that i made to myself and um because when i looked into uh, the butcher cover, and I was taking a look at dismembered body parts. Uh, dismembered body parts can represent mind control or being transformed into a different kind of being. This is kind of strange. So this would be the connection to the departed biological Paul McCartney and Billy still in the physical realm. And if and when you read memoirs, Billy talks about this this spiritual connection that he has with Paul, that in essence, his physical existence possesses two spirits, that of Paul McCartney and that of himself. And, and actually, Billy depicts this on the album uh, cover of his McCartney 2 album, where he has his face center, and then there's two shadows, one yeah. to his left and one to his right. Mm -hmm. And I know, folks, that this is very, very, very esoteric and probably very weird for a lot of people. And it was very esoteric and very weird for me as well, you know, before I got into this stuff. And, and as I started digging into it, you're able to kind of bring the pieces of the puzzle together. The other problem with this cover, and I'm going to put this out there, is that baby parts are um, associated with ritual abuse. Okay, so uh, trauma-based mind control programs and ritual abuse. Um, so is that what they're also putting out there depicting? I don't know. It could be. We talked about the bird cages. Well, a bird cage is Illuminati symbolism for mind control, to be a mind control slave. And we have images of Paul and George specifically with bird cages on their heads. Mm -hmm. This is not hard to find. All you need to do is do a research, uh, do a search in Google. And I have uh, other images of John with his head next to a bird cage, and he's in a Superman shirt. And the Superman shirt goes back to the concept of becoming a god. Crowley saying, every man and woman is a star. There is no god other than man. So the Superman shirt represents, uh, it, it, it's, it's referred to in German as the Ubermensch, the superhuman. Mm -hmm. So that's, what, that's what's being depicted there. So what they're doing is they are, they are communicating out. And many times who they're communicating to is not the masses because they consider us profane. They 
they know 99.9% of the population is not going to understand anything. Many times they're communicating with any, uh, between each other, mm -hmm. within the secret societies, this esoteric communication goes on. Okay. So put your cover, like I said, very disturbing. Um, the Beatles first album, which seems very, you know, very straightforward, very innocuous. But the thing is, the Beatles are looking down at us. So what, what's being depicted here, as an example, the Beatles, the numerology for the Beatles is the number 10. So in numerology, the number 10 represents new beginnings. So what's being depicted here is the Beatles are going to change things. There's going to be a transformative process that's going to take place. There's going to be social engineering and, and uh, um, uh, social scientists are going to reshape the society and the culture. This was photo was taken at the EMI building. EMI has numerology of nine, just like number nine on the White Album. Mm -hmm. The number nine is all around the Beatles. Number nine refers to endings, changes, transformation. So they're, they're have, they have the picture taken at the EMI building, the number nine, endings, and then the Beatles at the top of the album cover in yellow with numerology of 10. So we're leaving the old, and we're coming in with the new. And the Beatles are looking down. And we can see if we go um, up, right? It's 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 going up. This is this is in reference to illumination and enlightenment. Mm -hmm. So hey, follow us up to illumination and enlightenment. And in fact, um, in my 2020 uh, presentation, did the Beatles write all the wrong music? There was a clip I had from Derek Taylor, who was their press secretary, and. Derek was on a talk show and he was talking about wanting to be in the light, being illuminated. And that's why he was connected into the Beatles. So the Beatles are all about illumination and enlightenment, but it's a Luciferian take on enlightenment and illumination. And just fo so folks know, because a lot of times people think that I'm coming at this from a Christian perspective. I'm not Christian. Um, I was born and raised a Catholic. I spent some time in uh, Christian church many, many years ago, but I'm, I'm a long time deist. Okay. So I just want to put that out there because I don't want people to, to misinterpret that, you know, that I'm on one side or the other side. I'm just researching and reporting. Okay. Then we have the Beatles second album, which was released. Oh, by the way, um, please, please. He was released on March 22 of 1963. 322 is the skull and bones number from Yale university. Okay. So we have that occultism. Uh, that occult aspect, I should say, of the album as well. Then with the Beatles, uh, and I'm going through their UK albums because these are their official releases, not the Capitol. Capitol wasn't wasn't their official releases. It was the UK releases off the Parlophone uh, label, that, which is part of EMI. So here we have the shadow effect. We have one-eyed symbolism on with the Beatles. With the Beatles in the UK was released on March 22nd, 1963, it's the same day that John F. Kennedy was assassinated. March 22nd, 1122, when you add those numbers together, is 33. 33 is representative of the 33 degrees of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Now, what the Beatles did, what EMI did, was uh, to not release this album in the U.S. on March, uh, excuse me, on November 22nd. They waited, I think, until January of 63 to release the U.S. version, which was Meet the Beatles. This is with the Beatles. Mm -hmm. The reason given in the book as to why they did that was not because they were showing respect for John F. Kennedy. It was because they didn't want record sales to be harmed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because right, they thought that, that that event would put a damper on the ability to sell uh, meet the Beatles in the U.S. Wow. A Hard Day's Night. Okay. So in a Hard Day's Night, what we have is, again, we have a lot of the shadow effects. It's black and white. The black and white is representative of duality, the light and the dark. And we can see there's a lot of one-eyed symbolism as well. We have this image here. This is John. This is symbolic of the owl. He's doing the owl symbolism. And the owl in Freemason and Freemasonry is representative of wisdom, enlightenment. Uh, the owl can see through the dark. Mm -hmm. So the, the owl is, uh, is, represents, represents illumination. 
this is an interesting cover because at first you're like, what the heck is going on with this? It's, it's so nondescript. And this is the Beatles for Sale album cover. This was their fourth album. And um, but when we take a look at the back, we can see that it's it's autumn, it's fall. This is in reference to the Egyptian god Atum, who was the creator god in Egypt. The Beatles occultism, a lot of it, a lot of it goes back to the Egyptian mysteries, back to Egyptian mythology of Osiris, Isis, Horus, and Set. In fact, I'm convinced that the reason why the Beatles albums, especially up through Revolver, had 14 tracks is because in Egyptian mythology, when Set kills his brother Osiris, he chops him up into 14 pieces. Wow. Okay. And, but Hard Day's Night has 13 tracks. And I also believe that is tied into the very same mythology because when Osiris is dismembered, his wife, Isis, puts him back together again. And when she does this, she's able to find 13 parts, not the 14th. Mm. So A Hard Day's Night has 13 songs on it but all the others have 14, okay? And, and, and also 14 can be derived seven plus seven or 77. That goes back to Crowley's book, 77. And Crowley's book, 77, talks about applying one's will. So pursuing your true, pure will. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, Occultism, like I said, within the Beatles, it has to do with, uh, you know, a lot of it has to do with numerology. Why are numbers important? A lot of people say to me, oh, I don't believe in the numbers and numbers are just nonsense stuff. But in occultism, numbers are important because occultists believe that numbers have a certain vibrational, uh, they have vibrational characteristics. And when you play into those vibrational states, you can actually manifest your goals and objectives. And this is why they're so keen on, on numbers and astrology as well, because astrology is viewed as um, divination, being able to foretell, to look into the future. Mike, when you look at, when you look at, and we, we're going to get into this because I, I firmly believe this is alive and well today. When you look at Tavistock yeah. and you look at the occult, is there a marriage there or are we talking about two totally separate different things? No, it's, it's one and the same. It's one and the same. In fact, if, if folks, I recommend you read this book as a, a primer to Tavistock and it's, it's a book by Daniel Estulin and the book's been out about, you know, I don't know, 14, 15 years now, social engineering, the masses. It's very clear that these, these organizations like Tavistock and when we talk about these organizations, these are internationalists organizations. These are, this is the shadow government. This is the deep state. This is the, the government behind the scenes. The, the government that you interact with, or you think you're interacting with every day with presidents and prime ministers and senators and house of representatives and stuff like that. That's a puppet show. Okay. The real power is behind the curtain and the real power are occultists. I tell my audience all the time, that the controllers are occultists. And, and once you understand this, even if you have a basic understanding of some of the occult symbolism, you will see it over and over and over again. My wife and I were just talking about this this morning. It's pattern recognition. It's patterned everywhere. Mm -hmm. We saw it with the March 2020 event. I won't say it here because I don't want the, the video to be bounced off of YouTube. But it's the same thing there. There was all kinds of occultism and, and numerology built into that event. So it's it's really, um, they are intertwined, Vince. It, it, it's part of their, their MO, occultism. So um, you really can't separate it out. You really can't. And another book that you, folks could read is this one here by Dr. John Coleman's The uh -huh. Committee of 300. Yeah. And Dr. Coleman gets into the committee of 300 Tavistock reports into the committee. And he also gets into the, the entire deep state organizational chart, the structure 
of who's plugged into who. You know, so it's uh, I will talk more about Tavistock. Right, let me just run through these albums real quick. Wow. Then we have um, this here, the album cover, the Help album cover. And you know, we were told way back when that the Beatles were using semaphore signals and they were spelling out help. Well, that's they're not doing that at all. In fact, those signals that they are displaying don't even come close to the word help. What are these symbols? These are uh, Alistair Crowley ritual symbols. And it goes back to Egypt. And I covered this in one of my videos as well. But this album cover is extremely occulted. Rubber soul. Well, rubber soul, you can see that it's distorted. The, the actual image of the Beatles themselves is slightly distorted. Rubber soul itself. It's actually what, uh, what rubber soul, my interpretation of it is that it is the, um, the manipulation of consciousness. It's the manipulation of your soul. Again, as I, I talked earlier with the social engineering, these social scientists, they want to reshape your thoughts. They want to reshape your, your morals, your ethics, your beliefs, and take you down a completely different road. So you have a rubber soul, something that is something that is pliable, something that you can shape. Last but not least. So the Revolver album has got a lot of lot going on here, okay? So I'm not going to focus on the front of the album cover. We'll let folks, you know, take a look at that. But Revolver itself is referring to Paul McCartney, biological Paul revolving out and Billy revolving in. But more importantly is the back cover. So we have the Beatles. They're all wearing sunglasses. It's very bright in that room. And what are they telling us? They're talking about well, what they're depicting is Illumination, enlightenment, the light, the light bearer, Lucifer. And we can even see over John's head, they've got this, what appears to be a light. And uh, again, a very interesting back cover. So whenever they were putting the covers together, we didn't give it much thought. I, I didn't give it much thought. But as I got into this research and I started taking a look at what they were putting out. And I was able to uh, apply the occult, uh, the occulted research that I was coming across and putting the pieces together on. I was able to, you know, start stitching things together. So in any case, the reason why I wanted to take you through that is because uh, you and the audience, Vince, is because it's not just the Butcher album. Right. No, not at all. Not okay. just the Butcher album. Yeah. Okay. So I, what, what else did you want to discuss? Well, Mike, here, 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 here's, there's so much I want to discuss with you, bro. But when, when we go back to Tavistock, listen, guys, <laughs> go back to the four lads from Liverpool. There's footage, there's recorder recordings. We know the cavern, we, you know, bro, they were a run of the mill boy band. They were really not that good. They were average at best. Now, Mike, you do not know this, but this is, this is the connection that I make. I got a friend in the wrestling business <clears throat> who is a wrestler. His name is Jeff Jarrett. Jeff lives in Henderson, Hendersonville, Tennessee. Okay. Jeff White, Jeff's wife passed away. Well, there was a unknown singer at the time that befriended Jeff's three little girls. Three little girls were left without a, mo a mother. And this, this struggling star in Hendersonville, Tennessee, befriended these three girls. Went to the girls' house, made cookies with them, spent time with them because their mother passed away. Put them in one of her early music videos. That girl is now Taylor Swift. Mm -hmm. And I have said this a million times, and I'm going to go one step further after I hit Taylor Swift. Bro, there are a hundred Taylor Swifts out there. 
There are a hundred women that look like Taylor Swift, that write songs, that probably sing better than Taylor Swift. Hundreds upon hundreds. Why Taylor Swift? And I got to tell you, Mike, I was blown away. I was blown away last weekend, man, because one of the latest crazes is a dude by the name of Bad Bunny. And you, but Brad, Bad Bunny, 25 billion followers on social media, this, that, and the other thing. Mike, I know who Bad Bunny is. Never listen to Bad Bunny music. So on this past week's SNL, Bad Bunny performed two songs. So I'm like, I've got to see this Bad Bunny craze. Meanwhile, the audience is going nuts, yelling, screaming, the whole nine yards. This dude delivers two songs, Mike, and he absolutely sucks. Like, sucks, bro. Like, literally, if that if one of his songs came on my car radio, I would go to another channel. But yet, this dude is larger than life. And it's, you know, again, you, you try to explain to people, bro, <laughs> there are a billion bad bunnies out there. There are a billion bad bunnies that, that are better. There are a billion Beyond, Beyonce's out there that are better. Why them? And, and, and man, as I look at this now, and, man, I'm, I'm no doubt in my mind it was before the Beatles. And maybe you can give me a little history with Tavistock and who did – was it Sinatra? I, I mean, I don't know. But, you know, there, there, there's a common thread here, bro, especially when it comes to music, pop culture, entertainment, getting to the youth. If you can control that – and get your message across, to me, it's a no-brainer. It goes back to George Martin's comment when he first saw the Beatles. I right. was not that impressed, but what was he looking for? What was he looking for? He was looking for somebody to play the part. We, we can, I can work with them. Now, I mean, Mike, when people, I swear, I'm going to get all these comments about how crazy I am. But you, somebody has to explain to me why the Beatles, why Taylor Swift, why Bad Bunny? Because there's no doubt in my mind, even like I said, man, the 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 applause and the hooting and the hollering that Bad Bunny got, there's no question in my mind they planted those people in the audience to do that. There is absolutely no question. Mike, am I nuts? Please tell my people I'm not nuts. No, you're not nuts. You, you know, what you have to understand, folks, is that the music and entertainment industry is completely controlled. And it is a gigantic tool in the toolbox of the controllers. Now, who are the controllers? The, the, uh, the uh, Illuminati, uh, whatever label you want to give them. It's the shadow government. It's the deep state. Okay. And if you don't think that these entities exist, then I don't know what to tell you. Because it should be very, very apparent, especially over the last three years, going back to the March 2020 event, that that was a highly coordinated worldwide event where everybody was reading from the same script and implementing the exact same process worldwide. And um, so, I mean, folks, folks who don't believe that will have to, at some point, they'll have to do their own research and figure out that what we're talking about here, I mean, th this is how the world works. So let me just, let me just say one thing. I sent Vince an email going back about a week ago, and I said, we have to look at the etymology of the word entertain. And so entertain, the etymology is to keep up, maintain, to keep someone in a certain frame of mind. In other words, to control your mind, to keep you in a box, to keep you controlled. So if I go back to, let me just pull out a piece of paper I have here. It's a summary of Tavistock. So Tavistock, this is a slide I had in one of my presentations, okay? It's called The Hidden Face. And the reason why I call it The Hidden Face is because if you go on Tavistock's site, you know, it's like, it's like motherhood and apple pie. But Tavistock is really the world's center for mass mind manipulation and social engineering activities. 
It's a sophisticated organization used to shape the destiny of the world by changing the paradigm of modern society. So in other words, they're into social engineering, changing things. They have control mechanisms in academia, your colleges, your universities, your schools. They control the Department of Education, you know, uh, through all of their attachments to other organizations. You have to understand this is like a big octopus, this international structure. It's all interconnected. Multimedia, intelligence, the intelligence agencies. We talk about the CIA. We talk about MI6. We talk about the FBI, MI5, the Mossad, all of this stuff is tied in medicine, pharmaceutical companies and drugs. Okay. So the drug, the drug business comes in under, you know, Tavistock, the CIA, like I said, because they're all connected at the hip. Tavistock was heavily uh, funded and involved with the Rockefeller foundation as well. It's just so that, so if anybody wants a U.S. tie to Tavistock, take a look at, you know, the Rockefellers. So their range of disciplines include anthropology, economics, organizational behavior. So in other words, a, a corporate mindset, as an example, um, political science, psychoanalysis, psychology, and sociology. So Tavistock was a follow-on from what was referred to as Wellington House, Department of Propaganda for the British military going back to World War I. So when World War I ended in 1918, in 1920, the Tavistock Clinic was created. Now, the Tavistock Clinic, if you go into you know, their website, you go back into their history, they say that it was created so that they could help soldiers from World War I who were suffering from trauma, from being shell-shocked. So what they're really saying is we're getting into the business of really understanding human psychology is what they're saying. Then in 1947, it became the uh, Tavistock Institute of Human Relations. But in that whole time, Tavistock is involved in understanding the human mind, how to manipulate the human mind, how to social engineer. And these, this is done through people that are known as social scientists, you know, people that understand how the mind works. And, um, and as I mentioned, their reach is, is far and wide. And over time, when, you, when you're talking about, let's if they were founded as the Tavistock Clinic in 19, 1920, that's 100 years. Mm -hmm. A century has gone by in which they are a primary force in, in social engineering. Okay, so that's what we have to understand. And, um, and they are very much into the occult. And as I mentioned before, you read Daniel Estulin's book, and you'll get that in spades. You'll understand that a lot of occultism is brought into how they go about their business. So when we talk about, you know, Taylor Swift, and we'll get into um, Bad Bunny in a moment. Mike, I got to show you something real quick. Yeah, go ahead. What, what, what did you say about being in a box? Oh, I said they, they want to keep you. They want to keep humanity in a box. They want to keep you contained. They don't want you going outside. There you go. Inside Look a at box. that. I, I, mean, I, I mean, seriously, like, how do you just take that picture? Right. Right. I'd love to know what the two million means. Though. I don't know. I don't know, Very um, interesting, though, but though. your head being in a box is, is, is the same thing as saying that you got your head in a birdcage. Yeah. You're captured. Yeah. Your mind is captured. Yeah. Look at him. I got to want to interrupt. No, no, it's okay. So, you know, what, when I did the Beatle research and going back to your point, uh, Vince, the, the Beatles weren't very good at all. I mean, when they went to Hamburg in August of 1960, they were marginal at best. Mm -hmm as musicians and they showed absolutely no signs of songwriting. Okay. But we'll leave that for another day. Uh, I'll leave the link to my, my presentations on their music and you'll have a much better understanding of, you know, how they evolved and it wasn't organically. Okay. But once you go through the Beatles and you understand how that inorganic unnatural process took place to put them on a trajectory, to take them from being absolutely, you know, nondescript, uh, you know, group of guys that were banging a drum and playing guitars to worldwide uh, phenomenal status by the time they landed in the U.S. in February of 1964. I mean, when you take a look at that trajectory, it was only three and a half years. Mm. How does that happen? Yeah. How does that happen? It's not natural. So when I took, I don't follow 
Taylor Swift. I mean, I know who she is, okay, mm-hmm. but I don't listen to her music and all that stuff. I've seen I've seen videos that have to do with her stage presentations and all of the occult symbolism that she's flashing or what that's flashing across the screen in in those video presentations. Mike, do you know? I don't know if you know this or not, but there was there was a a, a, a phenomenon when she was on this era tour. Mike, they would they would uh, interview people after the show. Yeah. And I'm talking about people in their 20s. I'm talking about mothers. I'm talking about adults. Bro, there were a large, a large percentage of people that couldn't recall the show. Yes. I, I mean, and I'm not talking about just one. There were a number of people, adult, not 13-year-olds, adults that didn't remember what they just saw. Can you please explain that to people? Trance state. So what happens is um, these presentations that take place on stage, what happens is, you know, there's a certain, first of all, there's a certain cadence to the music. Also music has frequencies. And one of the things that is is used um, in the military industrial complex is frequency uh, to affect the person's mind, or even to affect their body. Okay, so um, George Martin was uh, really uh, very well versed in uh, the effect that frequency, the fre- in this case, the frequency of music, had on the listener. And that's why, myself included, when I when I would listen to Sgt. Pepper, the, the music was colorful. In fact, I used to explain to people that. I used to love psychedelic music because it just gave me a sense of color all around me. Now, not everybody's going to going, going to get these types of um, experiences. So in any case, the point being is frequency plays a big part. But the other thing, folks, is the lighting. So if there's a lot of flickering of lights, uh, the way the lights are positioned, strobe lighting, um, that's going to put people into a trance state. And when you take a combination of all that stuff, there are going to be those people, that segment of the audience that's going to trance out. It's like I, Vince knows this. Um, I was a, a master, certified master hypnotherapist. I was board certified with the International Association of Counselors and Therapists. And I was in practice, private practice for 12 years. And whenever I brought my clients in and we were doing sessions, let's just say I was doing a particular session and it was two hours And after they came out of the session, they emerged. I would say, how long did that session seem to you? They would say, oh, 20 or 30 minutes. Mm. It was two hours. So there was time distortion. There was just, you know, they lost a sense of time. And this is what I believe is taking place in, you know, in some of these concerts. So that's what's going on there. So there's, there's this hypnotic approach to these shows. And why are they doing that? Because once they get you in trance, then the message or whatever words are being sung, those become the hypnotic suggestions. What we refer to as post-hypnotic suggestions. The reason why we say post-hypnotic means these suggestions leave with you after the session, post the session. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, in my case, obviously I was using hypnosis to help people, to help them lose weight, Stop drinking, stop smoking, stop vaping, uh, be a better public speaker, have more confidence and stuff like that. But like everything else, I mean, there's an upside, there's a downside to stuff. And these people are very, very, very good at what they do as far as understanding the human mind, the psychiatry and the psychology of the mind and and trans, and, and um, putting people to trans state and uh, hypnosis. Now, when I looked at Taylor Swift's Wikipedia page, I, I just couldn't believe it. Okay. It was like, first of all, it was like about a mile long. And we have to remember that this, this girl is 34 years old, folks. She's only 34 years old. So what I wrote is uh, immediately they talk about pop culture. So what is pop culture? Pop culture is a culture that is spoon fed to you out of your television set and the media. It's, it's a culture. It's superficial. It's, music videos, it's pop music, it's TV, it's Hollywood, it's movies, it's Netflix, it's hamburgers, okay? That's pop culture. There's 
Your true culture would be your roots back to your ancestry and the traditions of your ancestors. And so what they do is they want to erase all of that. They don't want you to have a connection back to your past and back to your family and back to back to uh, ancestral traditions. They don't want that because those types of values, they're, they're very difficult to break. And this, this is an impediment to them to move forward to where they want to go. This whole hive mind, one world government, one religion, right? Which I believe they want to have in place by the 21st century. But that's a story for another day. So, you know, Taylor Swift is a, what they refer to is uh, as a social influencer, which means she's shaping culture. She's there to shape culture. Another way of saying that is it's social engineering. Tavistock would call it social engineering. So social influencer, shaping culture, social engineering are all the same thing. It's the celebrity culture, right? So um, in fact, they call her followers Swifties. It's a cult, okay? So Tavistock is in the business also of creating cults. A lead, you have a leader, a cult leader, in this case, a person like Taylor Swift or the Beatles, and they have their legions of followers, fans, okay? Um, it's all about celebrity worship. So the people worship celebrities. So cele my advice to folks is if you haven't watched this series, it's called American Gods. It was three seasons. American Gods explains how technology is the new God. And what they're doing is, I, I, I talked earlier about how they capture your thoughts. They capture your consciousness. It's really your non-physical energy because your thoughts create. Nothing around you, take a look at anything around you, wouldn't be here if it wasn't a thought at first. So they want to steer your thoughts so they can manufacture their version of their reality. Mm -hmm. Because what, what Luciferians do is Luciferians, Crowley teaches, do as thou wilt, shall be the law, love under will. So what he's saying is, pursue your true, pure will. And so what Luciferians do is they invest in what it is they want to pursue, what they want to be, how they want to manifest their lives. And then they create an external world that mirrors their internal world. Okay, so that's what they, they focus on, mastering their, their what they call their true or pure will and then creating an external world that mirrors it. What do most people do? 99.99% .99 of the population, they do the absolute opposite. They take the external world and they bring it into their internal being. Mm -hmm. So they don't have their own internal will. You have embraced the will of an external world that was created by the controllers. And this is what many, many people have a hard time understanding. And so what they put out there for you, for everybody, is what's referred to back in Rome, it was called bread and circuses. Feed them, they'll be happy. Circuses, give them games, give them entertainment. Keep them occupied with food and, and you know, just inane stuff. And that will distract them. And while they're distracted, we're going to go do our thing over here. And we're going to reshape the world and society and the culture the way we want the, the world to look. That's how it works, okay? So when I looked at, let me just go through Taylor Swift real quick, because I'm going to tell you right now, there's nothing organic about Taylor's trajectory, in my opinion. It's the same thing. It's the same model that applies to the Beatles. If you, if you, if you went from the Paul is Dead channel to the Taylor Swift channel, I am 1,000% con 1, convinced you would be telling us a very similar story. Yeah, so let me just go through a couple of things here real quick, Vince. So I, I took a look at Taylor Swift. And so she was born on December 13th, 1989 from West Reading, Pennsylvania. She's 34 years old currently. Um, you know, the write-up says that she is a tremendous influence on the music industry. And she is a prominent cultural figure of the 21st century. So you have to be... You have to pay attention to the words that they use. She is a prominent cultural figure in the 21st century, which means she's shaping culture. It says that she began a professional songwriting at age 14. Do I believe that? A 14-year-old? Not really. 
She has sold over 200 million records globally. Now, you don't sell those that volume of records unless you have a tremendous machine behind you. Back in the 1950s, you couldn't even get a song on the radio unless you paid payola. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All of the music that is that is on the charts today that are you know just banging it on Spotify, this is all predetermined. Artists are placed where the controlling apparatus wants to place them so that they can continue to do their social engineering. She's the only act to have five albums with first week sales of over 1 million copies in the U.S. She has been featured in lists such as Rolling Stone's 100 Greatest Songwriters of All Time, Billboard's Greatest of All Time Artists, the Time 100, and Forbes Celebrity 100. Now, remember, folks, she's 34 years old. And to be 34 years old and to be considered in Rolling Stone magazine's 100 greatest songwriters of all time, you have to ask yourself, how is this happening? It's happening because it's all fabricated. It's all manufactured. It's all orchestrated. Her accolades include 12 Grammy Awards, a Primetime Emmy Award, 40 American Music Awards, 29 Billboard Music Awards, 23 MTV Music Awards, three IFPI Global Recording Artists of the Year Awards, and 101 Guinness World Records. <laughs> okay, so now here's the thing. I'm going to get to something else here. That I, now, the Christian audience, okay? You have to pay very close attention to this because one of the things that the Illuminati did back, the controllers did back in 1962 was to declare religion, uh, declare war on your faith. So Taylor Swift in her Wikipedia page says she's a Christian. Now, this is a tactic that's used very often. The controllers are looking to dismantle Christianity. Why is that? Because it's in the way of their new religion, which is pagan based. It's Luciferianism. You can't have Luciferianism. You can't have a pagan based religion if you've got Christianity in the way. So they put these artists up there and they say they're Christian. So what happens is then the Christian youth plug into them because they believe what they're doing is they're following a Christian. Right? But it's a tactic. Okay? And now what's going to happen is it's the Pied Piper approach, right? I call the Beatles the Pied Pipers of, of the age of Aquarius, of Crowley's Eon of Horus. Well, Taylor Swift's doing the same thing. Right? She's leading you down a path that's not going to look anything like Christianity at all. At all. All you have to do is watch some of her videos and take a look at the occult symbolism that's there. So when she was around 12 years old, a computer repairman and local musician taught her to play guitar. Okay, so this computer repairman comes in, you know, hey, I'm going to teach you how to play guitar at 12 years old. In Nashville between 2004 and 2008, so now in 2004, she was 15 years old, Swift worked with experienced Music Row songwriters. So Music Row songwriters are the songwriters that are out of um, Memphis. Yeah. Okay. Um, Troy Vergas, Brett Beavers, Brett James, Mac McAnally, and the Warren Brothers. And she formed a lasting working relationship with Liz Rose. Now, how does a 15-year-old kid foster those connections unless she was on the radar and connected in in some kind of program going back many many years ago all right back when she was a kid a kid kid she's still a kid at 14 or 15 i'm talking yeah. about yeah. when she was like a young kid um various pop and rock artists have also influenced swift she lists paul mccartney now, this is something that a lot of bands, a lot of artists do. They they will refer back to the Beatles or, or Paul McCartney. And why is that? Because the Beatles are foundational to all the genres of music that came after them. Think of the Beatles as the foundation of that house that they're building. So they're paying homage to the Beatles and to, quote, Paul McCartney, which, of course, is Billy these days, right? That's what they're doing. Mm. Um She's described as a music chameleon. That's because you know, she started off in country. And the reason why she started off in country is because that's another thing that they needed to do. They needed to take the mindset of the, the country 
uh, music fan, which is rural for the most part, uh, guns for the most part, Christians for the most part, right? And now they need to reshape them. They need to transform them and move them over to a different mindset. Um, and I, I mentioned that she was referred to as one of the greatest songwriters of all time by several publications. This is in Wikipedia. I'm not making this up, all right? This is for the audience. Now, it goes on to say that Swift has made a profound impact on the music industry, popular culture, I just explained pop culture, the economy and beyond. She dominates cultural conversations and hence publications describe her as a cultural vitality or zeitgeist. What's a zeitgeist? A zeitgeist is a movement. They're describing Taylor Swift as a movement. Hmm. New York Magazine's Jody Rosen dubbed Swift the world's biggest pop star and opined that the trajectory of her stardom has defied established patterns. Hmm. Of course it's defied established wow. patterns because she's a manufactured entity. That's why. Um, According to publications, they don't say which ones, Swift changed the music landscape forever. And her ability to popularize any sound in mainstream music is one of her strong points. So she's she's moved uh, from different genres of music, started with country, and then she moved into rock. I think she did some techno and stuff like that. So what they're doing is they're moving her into different genres of different spaces so that she can take the influence that she has with her followers, the Swifties, right? And they can affect different aspects of, of, of music or different listening experiences, different groups of people, different segments of the population. Um, Swift's music, life and image are points of attention in global celebrity culture. So we're back to celebrity culture, we're back mm -hmm. to pop culture. Senior artists such as Paul McCartney, Mick Jagger, Madonna, Madonna, okay, <laughs> Uh, and Dolly Parton have praised her musicianship. Car Carol King regards Swift, her professional granddaughter, um, and thanks Swift for carrying the torch forward. While Ringo Starr, listen to this now, Vince. Now, while Ringo Starr and Billy Joel considered Swift the Beatles' successor. That's in the Wikipedia page. So she identifies as a pro-choice feminist. She advocates for LBGTQ rights. Swift's net worth is $740 million. She's 34 years old. So the reason why I mentioned pro-choice and LBGT um, is because these are these are part of the agendas that are in play right now. Well, okay? let, let me let me add to that, Mike, because uh, this this is th th like th this blew my mind. Mike, you know, like usually when there's a celebrity romance. Yeah. The paparazzi are catching them, you know, that goes on for a couple of months and then they go out in public. That's that's usually the way it's done. Right. Well, Travis Kelsey and, and Taylor Swift came out of nowhere. Right. There, there, there was no courtship. There was no nothing. Now, when you break that down, something very interesting happened. And I'm just piggybacking off of what you are saying. Taylor Swift is not political. She is she is not the jab no jab girl because she doesn't want to she doesn't want to divide her audience. So when it comes to stuff like that, she she doesn't go anywhere near it. Well, all of a sudden this famous football player Travis Kelsey comes out with a series commercial with a series of commercials of get the vax. Yeah. Get the vax. Right. Next thing we know, he's dating Taylor Swift. Now, Taylor Swift, who won't come forward and say either way, get the facts or don't get the facts. She not only is endorsing, she is dating somebody at the same time they're saying. Meanwhile, Mike, during the, 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 the football games on Sunday, when they keep showing her up in the, in the press box, they are playing Travis's uh, commercial, get the facts, back to back with the Eras Tour commercial of Taylor Swift, back to back. Right. And I'm like, how in the world can people not see that? I know it's completely manufactured. So, so with her not talking about 
the vax. That's because that's that's scripted for her. She's not going to talk about that because she had they have her at a certain place to do certain things. And like you said, Vince, then you have Travis Kelsey. Well, you know, he's another one. I mean, I, I did some research on him too. So, you know, he's he, he, I think he's been on the radar as well for you know for quite a while. And um, so to, to talk about you know um, their relationship, this is what I found here. Um, the alleged the alleged relationship between Kelsey and Swift had considerable impact on NFL viewership. Mm -hmm. Money, 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 right? Just not only money, viewership, merchandise. They had they had right. to make a Swifty jersey, right? <laughs> right. It says um, they said with the Chiefs Bears game drawing the most television viewers of the weekend. Kelsey's jersey sales increased by 400%. Yep. And an increase in sales of Chiefs home game tickets were also documented because I, I guess the Swifties are going to expect her to be in the booth, right? Yes, yes. So this is, folks, what, what this is, is this is, the, this is celebrity culture. And when you're in celebrity culture, you're worshiping. Mm -hmm. You're worshiping these people. And when you worship people, you disempower yourself and you're giving up your own authority. So you have to understand that this is what they're this is what they they're putting together. It's this pop culture. It's this this meaningless, inane culture that has no benefit to you, unless you think Netflix and hamburgers and stuff like that is a way of life. And when we talk about football games, I'm not knocking you know watching a football game. I was a huge Giants fan back in the day. But when you're when you're too connected into that stuff, that's the when I talked about in Rome, bread and circuses. The circuses part, football is the circuses part. Baseball, hockey, wrestling, ba wrestling, basketball. That's the circuses part. That's to keep you distracted. That's to keep you over there in that corner as much as they possibly can, so that you're not taking a look someplace else at things that are far more important that are going to impact your life. Don't look over there because what we're doing over here, legislative, uh, legislatively, with laws and stuff like that, you, we don't want you to know about that stuff. Yeah, We're going to pass that stuff at, you know, in the middle of the night over a Christmas vacation or whatever. So you just keep, you just pay attention to your television set over here. All right, just to wrap her up. Again, folks, she's 34 years old. 10 studio albums, four re-recorded albums, six films, seven concert slash documentary films, and six live performances. Okay? That's a lot. That is a lot. And um, so, like I said, this is the same model that you see all the time. Once you see the patterns, once you see how um, this is all put together. There's a story. It's a narrative. And these stories are put out there. I, I've uh, said that official narratives, which are official stories, that's what makes the world go round. Mm -hmm. Because that's what you're reading in the newspaper. That's what you're reading online. That's what you're listening to on your television set is official narratives. Are they true? Uh, in most cases, no. Okay. Um, there's a lot of... Uh, Lack of truthfulness in a lot of those stories and what you're fed, but you don't know any better because you trust it, mm -hmm. you know? So in any case, all right. So I, I don't want to bang on here about with Taylor Swift, but it's clear that, you know, she's a, an engineered manufactured person. Yeah, much like bad bunny that reaches a whole other different demographic. He had 40, he has, I took a look at him, 46 million viewers, uh, subscribers, I should say, or followers on Instagram. 46 million? So, I also read that he did some wrestling or something. Yeah, 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 Mike. Oh, <laughs> Mike. Mike, I could, I, could, I could talk to you all day, man. It's, yeah. It's, it's always such a great conversation with you, man. I don't know, Vince. I don't even know how I got into all this, to be honest. <laughs> Sometimes I listen to myself and I think, you know what? I, I need to take a break. And I do take a break every once in a while, you know. In fact, I, I took a break.
going back about a couple of weeks ago to the end of the year, but I, whenever, you know, you and I want to get together, then. Oh yeah, definitely. Cause together, I got a know? whole, like I was like, uh, man, I went into the um, back masking uh, oh. rabbit hole the other day and I'm like, I gotta, that's a whole other show, man. That, that is a whole other show. If you want to listen to some uh, back masking and it's crystal clear, play stairway to heaven backwards. Yeah. And, um, Robert Plant is singing about sweet Satan. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm not making this up. In fact, you can find the, uh, the back masking on YouTube. A lot of people have yeah. pulled that one yeah. up. And uh, like I said, that's not one of those back masking examples that you have to kind of like, you know, uh, is he really saying that? It's pretty clear. Yeah, no, that that was part of the uh, documentary. All right, Mike, listen, I know you are at sageofquay.com. I am. The Paul is Dead channel. I want to know, how can they listen to your music? That's what I want to know. Can we drive people to your music? Yeah, so just go to my my hub website, sageofquay.com, and there's a whole section there that will uh, take you to my my music. So you can go to my actual music website, which is laboroflovemusic.com, or you can click the Reverb Nation link or the SoundCloud link, and that'll take you to my music. I have three albums out. I released um, uh, No More Gods in May of this year. So it's, it's pretty recent. And I just released a new single, I Want to Fly, uh, yesterday. So that's up on my uh, Reverb Nation SoundCloud um, web pages as well. Now, if we play that backwards, uh, will I find anything in that record, Mike? I hope not. I mean, I, <laughs> I didn't intend to do any back masking, but, uh, you know... That would be an interesting little exercise to do, you know, to see if there's anything. And listen, since Mike has all this wisdom and all this knowledge, the next time I have Mike back, uh, he is going to be, he is going to have 20 platinum albums. Uh, he is going to be worth $590 billion. For, yeah, Mike, of all people to shut up, give Mike a deal like Taylor Swift. Yeah, that's not going to happen. You know why, Vince? Because first of all, to take that deal, you got to play in their sandbox. No way, man. No way, Absolutely man. Absolutely not. No way. Absolutely not. All right, everybody. Mike, I'm going to hit you up after the first of the year, man, because we, we we just scratched the surface here today. Anytime, Vince. It was really enjoyable. I love talking to you, man. All right, everybody. The great Mike Williams, Sage of Quay, Paul is Dead Channel. Check out his music. We'll see you here next time on Glass Onions.